Hello and welcome to Corpus Cast. You're listening to the podcast all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. Each episode, we'll explore how the study of language in large corpora is used to tackle challenges in the world relating to education, health, and technology, among many others. So, sit back, relax, and join us as we discover the ways in which corpus linguistics is shaping the future of the study of language. I'm your host, Robbie Love, uh, and I'm a corpus linguist at Aston University. Now, before we get started with uh, today's interview, um, we were excited to announce recently a collaboration uh, between Corpus Cast and Sydney Corpus Lab, uh, which is led, of course, by Professor Monica Bednarik, who was our guest from our last episode of 2022, talking about uh, TV dialogue and screenwriting. So uh, if you missed that episode and you're interested, then please do uh, look back through our archives and you'll you'll find that episode uh, number 12. Um, now, at the Sydney Corpus Lab, uh, for each month of this year, uh, they are publishing a blog with um, the answers of uh, previous Corpus Cast guests to our quick questions section, which of course is uh, a set of questions that we uh, ask our guests at the end of each episode. So uh, if you're interested to revisit some of the uh, responses uh, from previous episodes from 2022, then uh, do uh, check those out as they come out each month at sydneycorpuslab.com. Now, to today's episode, we're talking about the applications of corpus methods to the study of political discourse a very important area of research, of course, that investigates the language of governments, politicians, and political organizations. The language of people who have great power over large populations. The language that they use, of course, matters, and the analysis of this language can reveal strategies for reinforcing that power and encoding their ideological stances on uh, important societal topics. So to help us navigate through this fascinating topic is my guest today, Dr. Kwebena Safo Safo Kantanka, Associate Professor of English and Dean of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. Dr. Safo Kantanka specializes in political and parliamentary discourse using methods and frameworks from corpus linguistics discourse analysis, and pragmatics, and has published widely on political discourse in both the Ghanaian, um, but also the UK uh, parliamentary contexts. And you can find his work published in uh, journals such as the Journal of Pragmatics, Language, Discourse, and Society, and uh, CADAD, Critical Approaches to Discourse Analysis Across Disciplines. So it's a great pleasure to introduce to Corpus Cast Dr. Safo Kantanka. Uh, Kwebna, hello, thank you, and welcome, and uh, thank you for coming on Corpus Cast. It's great to see you. Hello, Robbie. Good to see you, too, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, uh, we've we've never actually met uh, in person before. Not at all. Um, but I, uh, I, I became uh, familiar with your your work uh, in in recent uh, months and and really was was really interested to hear more about what you're um, what you're doing um, so we'll we'll start by talking uh, as I do with all of my guests a little bit about their academic journey and and interest in corpus linguistics and then we'll 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 get into to really how you're using those methods to inform your your research on on parliamentary discourse. So um, with that in mind, uh, I'll start with the question I ask all of my guests, which is, what does corpus linguistics mean to you? Thank you very much, Robbie. Well, let me go this way. Assuming I want to study some language phenomena, and I've gathered my data, of course, naturally occurring data, and I look at my data, and I realize that it is so large that I can't manually read through to identify the phenomenon or features that I want to look at. Mm -hmm. 
And so I process the data. I put it on my computer. And I say, hey, I have a software program that I can use to manipulate the data using my computer so that I'll be able to identify the features I'm looking out for. So basically, that is what corpus linguistics mean, uh, uh, means to me, that I gather my data, I can read through manually, I use my computer with a software program, and I'm able to manipulate the data to be able to identify the things I'm looking at. So I'll contrast that, for example, with a manual way of reading and examining text, a text, sorry. So you, it's, a, it's, it's essentially a means to an end of, of dealing with, with uh, working in discourse contexts where there's quite a lot of language data occurring that you want to, to study. And, and I'm sure that is absolutely the case with parliamentary discourse, which we'll get onto in a moment. Um, but I want I to sort of dive a little bit into your own uh, academic uh, background and your, your journey, I suppose. Um, I say this most episodes, you know, people aren't usually born um, aspiring to be uh, a, a corpus linguist or uh, a discourse uh, analyst that uses corpus methods. They clearly um, learn about it somehow, some way. Um, uh, how did this happen for you? Was it when, when in your sort of educational journey did you first become aware of, of corpus linguistics and, and how did you become interested? Uh, in, in well, our uh, approaches. Thank you very much. Um, I did my um, undergraduate studies in the University of Cape Coast, the Department of English, where I teach right now. And I did my uh, Master of Philosophy, that's MPhil, in the same department. Um, in the course of the doing the MPhil program, um, I was somehow introduced to the idea of corpus linguistics. But that wasn't detailed enough. So I remember um, at a point in time applying for an MPhil program at the um, at UCL, London, that is uh, University College London. Mm -hmm. I remember I got the admission to uh, work under Gerard Nelson. Okay. Yeah. One, yes. Um, I got the admission, but I couldn't get funding. And at that time, I was interested in doing corpus linguistics anyway but I didn't know much about it as I, I do now. So I couldn't go to uh, UCL. And after my MPhil, I, I got appointed in the same department as a lecturer. So I taught for some time, I think for about four years, and I got admission to the University of Leeds on Leeds International uh, in Research Scholarship. And I got the opportunity to work under um, Dr. Alison Johnson. So, you know, Alison was also into um, corpus linguistics. I had the idea of working with um, Ghanaian and UK parliamentary data. So when I got to the University of Leeds, the idea of corpus linguistics came in strongly. Mm. And so I started reading around it, Alison, um, took me through aspects of it. And then um, David Wright, you mentioned not long ago, also took the opportunity to take me through. So it was at that time that I began officially to deploy corpus linguistics in my studies. And then in 20, that was 20, uh, 2013 when I went to the UK, the, the University of Leeds for my PhD. And somewhere June 2014, I also got the opportunity to go to a seminar at Lancaster University where um, McHenry and um, uh, Baker, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Paul Baker and Professor uh, McHenry, um, they organized a seminar on corpus linguistics. So I attended a seminar at the time, Richmond Sadiq uh, Ngula mm. uh, was there as a student. So I joined him. And that was a time I once again confirmed that, yes, it was something that I wanted to do, that I developed a stronger interest in corpus linguistics. So basically, that is how come I got involved in doing corpus linguistics. 
That, that's that's great. You you, you mentioned uh, a couple of people there actually um, that I want to pick up on. We did have a quick chat, of course, before we start recording, and we we established that we we do have uh, at least uh, one person in common, even though we've not met uh, ourselves. And that, as you mentioned, was uh, David Wright, who was uh, doing his PhD at Leeds at, at the same time as as you. And and David Wright um, is someone I've known for. Uh, probably about the same length of time. I right? probably was about the same time that I that I first met. I mean, we've gone on to to work together on uh, on a research project. Um, and you also mentioned uh, Richmond uh, Angula there, um, who I remember fondly from from Lancaster because we had uh, we had the same PhD supervisor uh, as you mentioned, Tony McHenry, uh, right. who was a guest on on Corpus Cast uh, a few months ago. Um, and I believe that Richmond actually is is now a colleague of yours at, at Cape Coast. Is that right? He is. He is. But currently, he's on leave in the University of uh, Botswana. Ah, okay. Okay. Yes. And he, he's supposed, actually, he's been there for two about two years now, and he's, he's supposed to be back this month. Ah. So we expect, yes, we're expecting him. Oh, Grace, Grace. Well, yeah. uh, when when you do see him again, tell him I, I said hello because... Uh, I'll do some, I'll do some memories of of our time uh, there. Um, so you you know you you sketched out your 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 journey there really, um, and your PhD project, as you mentioned, was uh, interested in parliamentary discourse, comparing um, Ghanaian uh, parliamentary discourse to uh, British parliamentary uh, discourse. Um, what we'll, we'll get into the sort of specifics and, and maybe the the differences and similarities between those two contexts in a moment. But to start with, on on a broader level, um, what is it that that interests you about uh, parliamentary language, parliamentary debates? What was it that that got you interested in that in the first place? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, um, I I have interest in politics because I feel that politics decides everything for me. Um, the water I drink, the quality of air I breathe, mm. the food I eat, everything, virtually everything is de determined by politics because it is a politician that uh, makes the laws. And we are supposed to abide by those laws and live by them and all that. Mm. And so, Yes, so I'm interested in what politicians do. And if I'm interested in what politicians do, one area that I'm so much interested in is, parli is a parliament. Because for the three arms of parliament, I feel that, uh, uh, three arms of uh, government, I feel that parliament is, is, is the most important. Because it's parliament that makes the laws, and the judiciary will interpret the laws, mm -hmm. or if you like, implement. It is parliament that um, has an oversight responsibility over the executive to make sure that the executive does the right thing and all that. So I see parliament as the, as the most important. And it is parliamentarians that represent me directly if you, if you go by democratic principles. And so if they are the, those representing me directly and I should know who they are, what their mindset is, what they think about me and what th they think about the people. Well, how do, so how do I get to know them? I need to study them. And to study them, I feel that the best way to study them is to study their language. Because by their words, we shall know them. So they need, not, they need not come to tell me who they are and what they stand for. Because they will always tell you positive things about themselves. Mm -hmm. But if I take the opportunity to study their language, and I examine, and I find out, and in an exploratory way, what they stand for, then I can understand what politics is all about uh, far, far better than if they come to tell me. So for me, it is about studying their language and getting to understand their discursive practices. We're looking at what are the linguistic issues and the sociocultural issues that are important to them and those that are important to the people. So I'm so much interested in the, in the discursive practices of parliamentarians because they stand for me and they represent me. And what they decide is the most important when it comes to the public good. So 
that is why I'm so much interested in what parliamentarians do and more generally what politicians do. And so, um, yes. Yeah, go go ahead. Okay. So because of that, I got interested in the in studying um, the Ghanaian parliamentary discourse for my PhD. But you know, Ghana's democracy is modeled on the on 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 that of the UK, you know, the oldest parliament. It's a younger democracy modeled on the like of the UK. And so when I started the work, I realized that where was there anything we could learn from the UK practice? Um, so that it can inform the Ghanaian practice or vice versa. Because the UK, even though it is very old, is a very old parliamentary system, the oldest in the whole wide world, it is still evolving, right? So you can also learn from the Ghanaian part. And then we can see how the two parliaments can inform each other in terms of their discussive practices. So I got interested in looking at the two at the same time for my PhD. And then after that, publishing... On, on, on some of them. And now, of course, if you are looking at some of the similarities and differences, I guess you ask something like that. Mm. Um, yes. For similarities and differences between the UK and the Ghanaian parliament, we can look at it from two sides, both linguistic and non-linguistic. Okay. Um, from a linguistic perspective, I would normally say that they are they are similar, more similar in terms of how they design their questions. And in fact, I can confidently say that in, parli in the parliamentary questions, there are no genuine questions. And that, that goes for both parliaments. I you know, questions in parliaments, both in the UK and Ghanaian parliament, are designed as to provide information or give opinions or sometimes even uh, uh, hint at their own answers. Those ways of asking questions actually go against the rules of parliamentary uh, questions. So, um, in both parliaments, you know, when you read Asking May, mm. uh, the most authoritative uh, treatise on, on parliamentary practices, um, it talks about the rules of questioning and the fact that questions are supposed to seek information or press for action. Mm. They are not supposed to express opinions. Mm. They are not supposed to insinuate. They are not supposed to be rhetorical. They are not supposed to suggest their own answers. But that's exactly what the MPs do, both in the Ghanaian parliament and the uh, UK parliament. Mm. So the way they design their questions is very similar. And then um, one other thing, there are several things, but I'll mention a few of them. Mm. One other thing I, I gathered, you know, um, in terms of politeness marking, um, you see that in the UK, there's a more conventional way of marking politeness, an indirect way. Mm. So, for example, uh, somebody will say, can the prime minister respond to this question? But when it comes to the Ghanaian context, it looks like, Politeness is marked more by lexical form. And that actually comes from the second language context. You know, in, in, uh -huh, yes, in, in the, you know, in the classroom situation, we are told that if you want to be polite, you use the past forms of the model. So instead of can, you say quote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead of, instead of, uh, 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 well, you say what? Mm. Okay. And so it looks like in a very formal context, that is always what the MPs are using in a Ghanaian context. So even when will is fine enough, mm. they'll use the word because thinking that there is a, they are in a, a very formal context. So when you, you use a corpus approach and you search through the use of the modal auxiliaries, mm. you realize that in the UK, you have a lot more world than word a lot more co uh, can than code. And in the Ghanaian context, it's the other way around. Ah, okay. okay. Oh, yes. So Ghanaians are using more of word as against world, more of code as against can. Mm. And so that is one linguistic phenomenon that is so clear in the data. Mm. But of course, um, yes. And then, you know, in, in parliament, the, there's a lot of, 
sensationalism. They argue, and therefore they use a, a, a lot. There's a lot of intensification. All right, because if I'm arguing against your stance in 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 Parliament, mm. how do I re, how do I emphasize my my stance? How do I emphasize my point? So you realize that very often um, there's a lot of a lot of use of intensifying adverbs, and if you like intensifying adjectives, and you realize that in the use of language, the UK MPs use more complex forms of intensifiers, uh. like adverb, yes, adverbs such as extremely, mm. absolutely. Mm. But in the Ghanaian context, you look, you see more simple forms just are very. Okay. So, yes. So, very, of, you find very in, in the Ghanaian context more than any other uh, adverb, if you like. And when they want to um, emphasize strongly, you can see something like very, very. So when I examine the data, I realize that in, when, a, when a UK MP say extremely sad, a Ghanaian MP is likely to say very, very sad. Okay. Okay. Yes. So this, all these indications of a second language situation mm -hmm. and a first language situation and the ability to, to change word forms, to the, the availability of a lot more choices for the UK MPs than the Ghanaian MPs and all that. So that is also an, another uh, linguistic uh, uh, difference that you can find between the UK MPs and the Ghanaian MPs. So of course, apart from the linguistic form, there are non-linguistic forms. Um, one thing that interested me most, uh, what I was happy about, or whether that I was amazed at. You know, I in the course of my research in the UK, I realized that at a point in time, the, the then um, Speaker of Parliament, um, is it John Beckel? Um, um, yes, at the time, yeah, the Speaker of the House. Yeah, yeah. Yes, had, had described the behavior of the MPs as public school tweetishness. <laughs> and and, and that... <laughs> And that that actually struck my attention. Mm. I was I was like, that's a very old parliament. If MPs could be described mm. this way, yeah, then what is in there? And I realized that actually, even the the people of uh, uh, the UK were not happy even about the behavior of MPs on the floor of parliament and others. So I decided to also look at the Ghanaian mm. context and see. And you realize that, uh, in a way, uh, the UK. Uh, parliament appeared to be um, a little more, um, a little rowdier okay. than the Ghanaian, the Ghanaian uh, parliament. And this is the reason. In the Ghanaian parliament, anytime there was a question, for example, that flouted the rules of questions, as according to Eskimo's uh, rules of questions, mm. somebody will stand up and say, that is against the rules. Or sometimes the, the speaker will say, that is against the rules. So rephrase the question. Oh. But you wouldn't, yes, but you wouldn't find that in the UK context. So it appeared as though in the UK context, the MPs had the, the, the free will mm. to express themselves and people could uh, 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 jump in and shout at each other and then um, say whatever. But I also thought that, that uh, it was there because of a practical reason. Sometimes, well, if you intervened, all the time asking people to rephrase their questions, mm. it delayed the process. You know, for example, question time, uh, Prime Minister's question time is only about, is it 30 minutes or one hour? So uh, I want to hear yeah. a lot more people speak. Yeah, fairly short. Yeah, yeah. Very short. So I thought that that was also, uh, could be the reason why um, MPs were allowed that kind of room to operate and say what they wanted to say and all that. That's, that's... And then, and then they, they, one other thing was that they also talked a lot more about unemployment, both in the UK and the Ghanaian context, unemployment. And then they were always talking about the people classifying people into groups, classes. And when it comes to the differences, you realize that the UK had a lot more, a, a multi-layered uh, classification of the people than their Ghanaian counterparts. So in the UK, you will see that they will identify subclasses 
of the people and link specific needs to these groups. Which actually I realize emphasize the welfare system that the UK operates. But in the Ghanaian context, it, it appeared as though some groups of people in the context of parliamentary discussions were overlooked. Uh-huh. So, yes, so I thought that that was very significant. So, in, for example, in the Ghanaian context, um, pensioners, uh-huh. old people, elderly people, vulnerable people wouldn't be seen uh, to be talked about. And, but that was very clear in the Ghanaian, uh, in the UK context. So there, there, there's a, a lot more that um, 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 I could find in terms of the differences and all that. But, you know, because of the time, maybe we can um, uh, end it here. But maybe going forward, the question will be how we're able to arrive at some of these things through the corporal support. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. No, no, thank you. I, I think it's it's really good to get a sense of the 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 similarities and differences in the context here. One one thing I did want to ask you to help paint a, a picture in my mind is um, that the British Parliament is 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 quite sort of uh, infamous, I suppose, for for having a, a very kind of adversarial layout where where political opponents literally sit facing opposite each other and and literally argue over a, a, a massive uh, table essentially um but you know a lot of other parliaments around the world take on uh I don't know the exact word for it but it's 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 a lot more of a uh, cooperative sort of layout where everyone's kind of sitting uh, side by side in a, in a in a sort of semicircle uh arrangement where if yes they're they're still disagreeing with each other but they're not literally opposing each other where does the the Ghanaian uh parliament uh layout kind of fit within these different models is it modeled from that that kind of adversarial uh British structure or is it something else because you're right that the UK parliament is known for being quite rowdy and uh lots of jeering and clapping and booing and and almost kind of pantomimical sometimes um maybe there's partly to do with the fact that they're they're almost encouraged to to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Press yeah, up against each other. <laughs> yes, it, you know the the seating arrangements for uh, for the UK and the Ghanaian Parliament. There's a little bit of difference, but in terms of the adversarial nature, mm. I don't think there's so much uh, difference. Mm. You see, the Ghanaian one is arranged in a semicircular form, but the the majority on one side the minority on the ones on the other side. So the majority on the right side of the speaker, the minority on the right and the left side of the speaker. But the majority sit in a semicircular form. The minority also sit in a semicircular form. But they sort of face each other. Uh, but you know, in the UK context, it is more directly mm. the, the government MPs and opposition MPs facing each other more directly, yeah. like two sides of a rectangle. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yes. So they face each other more directly than the U- the Ghanaian one. Mm. But in terms of the adversarial nature, uh, I, I don't think there's so much difference. It's, it's all, it all boils down to the 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 management of the procedures, the manage of the of, of the of the talk of the debates on the part of the speakers. Mm. Yeah. That is where. The, the difference, uh, I think, comes in. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. I mean, this is corpus cast. We're here to talk about how corpus methods are, are used. And um, I'm familiar with the with the, the UK context and that accessing the, the what will become linguistic data um, is usually in the context of parliamentary debates um, done through access to public uh, records of transcribed uh, sessions uh, in what's known as the Hansard. Um, the transcripts are produced by uh, staff who, who work at the parliament. Um, and for linguists, okay, they don't get so much control over the transcription because um, they generally are using transcripts that someone else has produced. Um, but it does make it relatively easy to to access the the transcripts of the uh, the sessions of the debates that you're interested in how does that work with the Ghanaian parliament is is that a similar kind of situation or does it did it work a bit differently uh when you started researching uh in that area yes it's similar um 
I I use the hand size. Mm. You know, these are uh, according to them uh, um, record uh, um, of of the proceedings of parliament. That is the debating uh, record of what transpires on the floor of parliament. And so, of course, um, you know, I read a paper, that's the hazard of, the, of hands out of, I think, I've forgotten the author. Uh, somebody did a UK, a study on a UK parliament mm -hmm. was talking about the hazards of the hands out. Ah, okay. When you are using it for your study as a linguist, because it is not produced for linguistic studies, mm. there are certain things you cannot find in there. Mm. And of course, also sometimes there's an opportunity for the transcribers to, to edit the language. And I realized that in, sometimes there are certain words that can be replaced, even in the context of uh, transcribing what the MP say. Mm. So um, you need to be careful how you use it. The Ghanaian parliament uh, uploads the handouts on, the, on their websites. Uh, previously, they didn't. So when I was in the PhD, I had to go there to collect the soft copy from them. Uh, really? Process. Yes. And so they uploading them on the website of the parliament uh, it was a recent phenomenon. I think um, um, coming from where somewhere 2016, 2017, when they started uploading it on the on the website. But previously, if you needed the soft copies, you had to go to Parliament, ask them to give it to you. And that's exactly what I did for my PhD. But of course, in the UK, you know, they started even 1604, mm. uh, they put information on their website. When I'm searching and looking for uh, hands on the on the website of the UK Parliament, mm. I could find um, data up to about 1604. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, and I was I was very happy about that. Mm. Okay, so you you can go to their website and and download as many as you can, but of course when you are comparing, when you are going to compare, it means you have to look at the range. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a Ghanaian data starting from say the nineties up to say uh, twenty uh, fourteen or fifteen, it means you are more likely to also collect data from the UK between that period and all that. So it can be comparable and all that. So yes, the, the hazards are the ones I use uh, the, uh, for the study. But of course, when you download the hazards, you have to uh, process, take it through a lot of, and that's the most difficult part of the work. You know, for, for corpus linguistics, the most difficult part is, is, is the data collection mm. and processing. If you collect your data and process and you finish, the rest is easy to, to do. It's easy to manipulate the data. So there are several things you have to do with the data that are there are parts that you need to delete uh, from some that there are pictures in there and all that. So you have to t uh, go through each of them one after the other, delete the parts that, that you don't need and then process it into text files or some other form that say where Smith tool or some other uh, corpus linguistic tool can, or software can manipulate. So it is, it's, a, it's a whole process. And, but basically, we use, I use the handsets from the UK and from the Ghanaian parliament. So, but when you, um, uh, uh, sort of the, the, the idea that you, you know, uh, came to lead, started your PhD, and then um, a moment of realizing that you'd, need to actually go in person to the Ghanaian parliament, but this was before, as you said, before they started putting their hand sides on, on the website. Um, was it simply a case of just going and, and, and you said you went and you obviously had to ask for permission. Was there a, a sense of, you know, well, what do you need it for? Was there any kind of suspicion or, oh, you, you're going to criticize a <laughs> language or tell it to a Was it just like, yeah, sure, take what you want? Or did you have to <laughs> kind of reassure them that you weren't, you know, that you were going to only do certain things with it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, you know, I, I took permission from the University of Leeds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had to go through uh, quite, uh, I would say, tedious process to seek clearance, to be able to come to Ghana, to collect the data, 
you know, if your data involves human subjects and all, they need to justify why and all that. So I did all that. So when the letter from the University of Leeds, and um, I had also sent an email to the editor, the one who was in charge of uh, parliamentary debates in Ghana, uh, telling him about what I was doing. And then with the support letter from the University of Leeds, when I came down and I explained things to them, it was easy for them to uh, give it to me. Um, of course, if you, if you go to parliament to buy, for example, the hard copies of Hansax, you can easily get it to buy. So when they understood that it was for academic purposes, well, of course, initially they, they were asked questions. There were questions about what I was going to use it for yeah. and all that. And so with the evidence of me being a PhD student and that was my focus of study and all that, and then the assurance that, of course, that was even going to inform parliament itself uh, about their own practices and all that, they were forthcoming. Uh, okay, that's good. That's good. Um, you, you mentioned earlier, of course, some of the, the broader linguistic differences uh, between the Ghana and UK parliaments. Um, but of course, in you know the more recent years, you, you've uh, focused more exclusively on the Ghanaian parliament. And um, I suppose looking at some of your, your recent publications, um, using approaches from uh, critical discourse analysis combined with 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 corpus methods, um, often known or as part of a a, a family of uh, approaches known as CADs, of course, critical uh, sorry corpus assisted uh, discourse studies. Um, a recent publication uh, in the CADAD journal that I I mentioned earlier caught my eye, looking at um, how. Uh, Ghanaian uh, parliamentarians discussed uh, gender-based uh, violence um, because, of course, this looking at uh, this sort of discourse, parliamentary discourse, gives you the opportunity to explore all sorts of different topics because that's, of course, the purpose of parliament. They're discussing all these different issues. So you publish on, you know, how they're discussing quite a range of, of different topics. And and as I say, one one that caught my eye was. Um, a, a recent publication about uh, gender-based violence. I, I wonder if you could say more about about the what you're interested in 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 looking at there and, and what you found. Thank you very much. You know, as I said, if you are looking at the discursive practices of parliamentarians, as you you rightly said, uh, you have a wide range of topics, thematic areas you can look at, and so um, sometimes the way to decide that is to explore the data, allow what is described as a couple-driven approach mm. to tell you what is in the data so you can explore. Um, for example, for the PhD, that's, that's what I did. When I gathered the data um, from the UK and Ghanaian parliaments, I was like, okay, so what am I specifically looking at? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I have the data, mm. I've collected it. And then the question is, so what am I going to look at? And so this is where uh, the idea of a corpus driven approach is very key. And then using the keyword approach, I was able to identify some focus mm. and then explore. Uh, but quite more recently, sometimes you see what informs some of the topics I look at is the currency of issues. So, you know, in, in a Ghanaian context, uh, gender has become a very topical issue. Mm. Um, it, it's become a, a, one of the issues we are looking at uh, currently. Uh, you know, on the back of, for example, the LGBTQ uh, issues, mm -hmm. gender has become a very important topic in the Ghanaian context. So the first paper I looked at in terms of gender was uh, I'll, from there, I'll come to the one you mentioned, mm, mm. Um, the gender-based violence. I looked at, the first one I looked at was the discursive construction of gender that is looking at men and women mm. in the Ghanaian parliament. So I wanted to see what MPs thought gender was all about and what they thought of men and women mm. in the Ghanaian context. And I realized that in the Ghanaian context, 
So I gathered all the data, all the hazards from uh, 2012 to 2020. I didn't leave any. You know, that is what, one of the advantages of using the couples approach. So what I did was to explore the use of gender, the use of women, men, female, male, these key terms, explore the data. And then what I realized was that anytime the MPs use the word gender, they were referring to issues affecting women. Ah, uh, gender, gender actually in the Ghanaian parliament means women and their issues. It's, the, it's about the world of women, mm. not men. Mm. Okay. And then they ascribe certain cultural practices to men, some to women. So if you come to the Ghanaian context, for example, there's a lot more masculine masculinity assigned to uh, men and more femininity assigned to women. So when it comes to some jobs such as the forces, the military, the police, and some and the allied uh, 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 agencies and all that, it's like they they always link to men. Mm. And then when 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 it comes to um, other forms like household calls or chores and what have you, it's more women. Okay, so I realized that MPs differentiated a lot more between men and women, assigning, of course, that was informed by Ghanaian cultural practices, where women, in terms of gender, are assigned specific roles, and men assigned specific roles. So when I looked at that, I got the interest to look at more other features. And of course, recently, there have been arguments about the passage of legislation in support mm. of an affirmative action. Uh, where women will be given a lot more space, a lot more political space, a lot more opportunities in 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 all facets of 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 society, and so one of them has been there are groups that have been fighting for a legislation on gender based violence. So after reading some of these things and listening to radio and all that, I thought that well. It will, it will be very interesting to look at what MPs thought about gender-based violence because their mindset and how they felt about gender-based violence will inform the kind of legislation they will pass. So I decided to explore what MPs thought. And actually, what I found out was that gender-based violence was actually an issue of women and not men. And so... Whenever MPs talked about gender-based violence, um, the issue of men never came in at all. Mm. And so it appears as though uh, men were not, uh, uh, if you like, uh, at home, at work, mm. and anywhere. And when you talk about gender-based violence, you are talking about violence against women, violence against children. And so... They talk about gender-based violence in three ways. The forms that they, they, they thought were there. So, for example, they'll talk about child abuse. They'll talk about um, mm. things such as um, child labor. They'll talk about rape. They'll talk about wife beating and all those kinds of mm. things. And then they will normally talk about the victims. And the victims of mm. gender-based violence by what we find out, the victims are actually women and not men. So, yeah. yes, um, you will never see a Ghanaian MP saying, per the study, that where we are talking about victims of gender-based violence, we have men. Even though in recent times, there's evidence that men have also reported cases mm -hmm. of, gen uh, uh, if you like, domestic violence against them, gender-based violence against them and all that. And so, and then after that, they will talk about the way forward to fight it. Mm. And mm. so they will normally talk about um, stronger legislation, the implementation of the laws and stiffer punishment against mm. people, and then education and all that. So we, we saw a three uh, 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 thematic area, areas of, uh, of, of, of talk mm. around gender-based violence in the Ghanaian parliament. And as I said, if you are talking about gender-based violence in the Ghanaian parliament, you are talking about violence against women and girls and children yeah. and not men. 
yeah or boys mm. okay and then we are looking at how to fight it and all that mm. so it is it, it, that is something that i found and i thought that well if that is what uh the feeling is then perhaps when we are passing the law it is more likely that we we are going to overlook the aspect where men also suffer gender-based violence and domestic violence and what have you so yeah this is something that they have we need to have a look at but from what you were saying as well, uh, it seems to be omitting or, or at least backgrounding the, the role of the perpetrators of the violence, which is, that, is, that is, is overwhelmingly that done by men, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, so I took, the, the assumption is that, albeit indirectly, uh, they say perpetrators are men mm. and not women. That, that's exactly what the data that we examine uh, exposed mm. using the corpus assisted approach. Very, very interesting. Thank you for for talking us through, you know, the the, the process as well, which um, of course is you know so much of, of what we're interested in beyond the the, the topic. Um, as as we start to 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 wind down here in 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 our conversation, um, uh, I want to sort of. Zoom out a bit. You, we mentioned it the earlier uh, earlier on your 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 colleague uh, Richmond and Gula, uh, you who will hopefully be joining you uh, again at Cape Coast uh, soon. Also um, a corpus linguist. Um, could you say more about the the role of um, corpus linguistics in in research and and teaching at at your university at, at Cape Coast? Great. Um, I am enthused about the interest that uh, people have developed um, here in Cape Coast over the period. You know, some of us started doing corpus lingu linguistics not long ago, I would say mm. um, about six, eight years ago. Mm. And um, we started teaching it officially in our department not long ago. Mm. But when I see the interest that our postgraduate students have developed in corpus linguistics. It looks very great. The future looks very bright. You know, in 2018 and 2019, no, sorry, 2018 to 2020, I became the head of department of my department. That's the Department of English University of Cape Coast. And having interest in corpus linguistics, um, I took steps to establish a corpus linguistic center. So oh, brilliant. Yes. So I, I bought a number of computers. We got we got a space for it and all that. So but after 2020 I left office. So the one who took over over from me um also started working on it. We are still working on it. We are not done yet. Um of course perhaps I have thought that if I were still there we will be done by now but uh, the process is still ongoing, and it is my hope that very soon we will get a corpus linguistics center. And I'm happy that there are colleagues even outside my department, some in social sciences, uh, who have read my work, and they come to me and they are they are happy and amazed at the methods I de I deploy in my analysis. That's mm -hmm. the corpus the corpus methods. And they, they want to come and learn it from me. And so when I see that a number of colleagues have, have approached me to mm -hmm. take them through the corpus linguistics approach because they feel that it can be used in other, other disciplines other than uh, uh, language and linguistics. And so, yes, we are pushing the agenda of corpus linguistics. If we were able to establish the center, we will be the first uh, 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 to have had that in in Ghana, and so we we have spoken with a number of people all over uh, Ghana, those in other universities who are ready to come mm -hmm. to us to 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 explore ways of um, um, using corpus linguistic approaches in their work and all that. And in fact, in 2020, we had a we had a workshop. Uh, we have a Linguistics Association of Ghana, and of which uh, we are members. If I say we, I mean myself and Ngula, uh, Richmond. 
Mm. Uh, and we led that discussion. Uh, we, Ngula and I, uh, led the uh, seminar and took the the um, association through corpus linguistic methods. We had over 48 slides and we talked about, you know, all the aspects and the applications and the tools and all that. And people were very happy about what they saw and heard. And so I think that um, going forward, we have an opportunity to be the first uh, in terms of approaches to, uh, a couple's approaches to uh, the study of language in Ghana. Brilliant. That sounds fantastic. I, I wish you all the best as as that continues to to develop. It sounds like you have some very exciting plans. I think uh, just you know we can add it to the pile of of, of evidence all over the, the the further spread and and development of the interest in corpus linguistics. And as you said, the applications of, of these approaches in in other disciplines as well, which is which is obviously something that we we've, we've seen happening over the the last uh, many years. Um, we'll start to to wrap up now. I'm going to bring us to our quick questions segment to finish the episode. Um, as always, three quick questions. We'll see how quick the answers are. Too. Are you ready, Quebener? Are you ready for quick? <laughs> I, I am. Re- I am ready. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. We're nearly there. Here we go. <laughs> quick, quick question number one. Uh, what is the biggest change you've noticed in corpus uh, research in your career? Okay, thank you. You know, um, reading from books, when I started looking at corpus linguistics, uh, we got to know that it started long ago, long before, but in different ways. From, if you like, the days of Franz Boas, the American linguist and all that coming to Chomsky's time and all that, and developing. And then in the 60s coming when the idea of the computer came in, and then the development became a little bit faster. But within the last decade, when I read around, I Google and I get to know the rate at which corpus linguistics is growing. Mm. I am amazed. Yeah. It is so fast in terms of the areas, the disciplinary area. Mm. It started as a purely language issue, a linguistic issue. But now it's gone beyond that. Yeah. It's gone into social sciences. As I told you, there are colleagues coming to me and all that. And so sometimes I feel that we're, we're, we, we, we may not go far with the idea of corpus linguistics because that limits the idea, but maybe mm-hmm. we should begin to describe it more as corpus studies so uh, that, yeah, so that we, <laughs> so that it can, it can incorporate the idea of all kinds of disciplines mm-hmm. because the corpus linguistics seems more like limited in an area you only yeah. want to do in linguistics. Mm. Obviously the corpus approach has gone, has grown beyond just linguistics. It has gone into other areas. So perhaps we, we, we should be talking more about corpus studies rather than corpus linguistics and all that. So that corpus I like will, be, will, be, will be just a, just a, a, a part or a uh, part okay. has some uh, a field of, of corpus yeah. studies and all that. Just like uh, discourse analysis and discourse studies, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that the growth is, is phenomenal. And as I said, um, in terms of even geography, you know, before I left for the UK, that's uh, in 2013, and, uh, we didn't know about corpus linguistics in Ghana in terms of people doing corpus linguistic studies and publishing them. We didn't know. And so yeah. it, it, the publishing in corpus linguistics it's just a recent phenomenon in Ghana. Um, I think um, Ngola, uh, that's Richmond, as I mentioned, and myself and few other colleagues. So I can confidently say starting from 2013, 14 coming. And mm. within the last few years, when I returned, say from 2016 coming, so roughly within the last six years, 
find a lot more people doing corpus linguistics in Ghana. Yeah. And then yeah. and then when you Google in Africa, you can see that people are now becoming more and more interested in corpus linguistics. So sometimes when I sit down, I feel that, well, it looks like uh, the manual way of examining language and linguistic phenomenon is gradually going to die out and corpus linguistics is going to take over. Going mm -hmm. forward, because, yes, because that's how I feel. Because, you know, in research these days, what I see is that uh, researchers are more likely to generalize their findings. You know, when you're able to generalize your findings, that, that feels more fulfilling. And if you want to generalize it, it means you need large volumes of data to be able to uh, 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 generalize your findings and all that. How do you do that? Mm. To do that, mm. you need a corpus linguistic approach. And then when I search around, you know, a lot more corpora are being built all around the world, mm. including the second language situations like Ghana, you, you know, the ICE, ICE project, International Corpus of English project is still ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. So I can see, and people are building their own corpora. I know a friend here who completed in my department, did his PhD. He's now teaching at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He used a corpus mm. approach. He actually recorded classroom lectures, transcribed, and used a corpus approach to study some linguistic phenomena in the data. Mm. And that was in my department. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, you can clearly see the phenomenal growth of corpus linguistics uh, yeah. uh, uh, taking place all over the place. And that's why I feel that going forward, it looks like it is going to uh, um, upstage the mm. uh, uh, manual way of examining linguistic data or language data. Well, you, you heard it here first, a uh, corpus cast exclusive. Is it corpus linguistics or should it be corpus studies um, oh, with oh, various oh. branches, including corpus linguistics is one of them? That's a, a, a wonderful prediction. We'll see. Um, okay, quick question number two. Um, what is the biggest misconception of corpus linguistics that you've encountered? Well, thank you. That, I think the biggest one is people who don't do corpus lingu linguistics think that it is devoid of context. Ah, okay. There are contextual properties of data. I remember I did a presentation here, and one of the works I spoke about, the uh, discursive construction of gender and women and men and all that. And I did a presentation in my faculty. We usually have a faculty seminar uh, series. So at a point in time, I did a presentation and one of the questions that came and, and, and I tried hard explaining that some people still didn't agree that where was the context? If we were looking at uh, the data that um, had been stored in a computer. And yet we are saying that the language must be naturally occurring. And if it's naturally occurring, context is very key. And people yeah. feel that, yes, when you are doing corpus linguistics, it is, it, it, it is devoid of context. You don't have the context, so interpretation becomes too dry, kind of uh, um, artificially constructed. And I said, no, I disagree. That's a big misconception because when you are doing corpus linguistics, we have corpus internal data and corpus external data. The data, for example, if I'm looking at parliamentary uh, 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 discourse, parliamentary hands out, like the gender-based violence I spoke about, mm. the, the corpus internal data will tell you what MPs talk about. But of course, the data, the debate was also held in a certain context. Mm. And we have other publications, we have le other legislations about gender-based violence, we have people who spoke about radio discussions and all that. And you put the data within that kind of context and you realize that actually the context is there. And even within the corpus internal data, at, you, you see you have access to the larger data. Mm. And so you can see what everybody else says about the same thing. And when they are talking about these things, sometimes they provide certain contextual properties that will let you understand the context in which a certain word or is being talked about or a certain phenomenon is being talked about. 
So it is a biggest misconception that I've ever come across. And I think that it doesn't, if I, as it, of course, if it's a misconception, the answer is clear. It means it's not true. <laughs> indeed indeed no i i think that's that's a that's a very it, it is a very good it is a very good point because um it, it is often a, a i suppose a, an accusation if you will that that corpus linguistics pulls things way too far out of the context and and um you know therefore is is that what is the validity of of the work we're doing especially with spoken data i mean that that is a still a real methodological challenge of how do we keep in mind um, how far away from the original speech signal we're, we're taking in the process of transcription, for instance, among other things. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we, we will uh, wrap things up there for this episode of Corpus Cast. This was really, really fun and really interesting to, to, to learn about you and your work. Um, your really important and very interesting work in in uh, parliamentary discourse um and uh a real pleasure to to have you on the show and of course uh, a pleasure i hope for uh, our listeners and viewers to um to hear all about uh political discourse and uh Quabina's research uh, at the university of cape coast ghana um so thank you for joining us uh, however you have accessed us whether that's on youtube spotify google podcasts and all the others you know by now um, why not subscribe on, on YouTube or Spotify, however you access uh, Corpus Cast, and chuck us a good old five-star rating while you're at it. Do let us know your thoughts about this and uh, any other episodes in the series using the hashtag Corpus Cast, and make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter, at Aston Corpus, and you can follow me at Lovemov. Corpus Cast is an Aston Originals podcast, uh, written and hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by my excellent colleague, Sam Cook. Um, so thank you for watching and listening. And of course, thank you to uh, Kwabana uh, Safo Safo Kantanka. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure too. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And, and congratu congratulations to you. Thank you very much. I think what you are doing is so great. Um, oh. uh, it will give a lot of people the opportunity to understand what corpus linguistics is all about. And so thank kudos, you. kudos for, the, for, for, for a good work done. Thank you. Thank you. It's well, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.